Hello, my name is Autumn Mathias, and I am an assistant professor of social work and sociology at Elms College in Chicopee, Massachusetts. And the title of my presentation today is Hope for Intergroup Solidarity, Intersections Between Memory, Positionality, and Respect for Religious Salience Among Diaspora Indian Christians. And this presentation is part of a larger project uh, that I completed for my doctoral research at Northeastern University. Um, and just a little bit of background why I decided uh, to pursue this research. Um, so once again, uh, really the main objective of the larger project uh, was looking at how um, Indian Christians in North America specifically uh, responded to instances of violence against um, Christians in India and what were their motivations to engage in transnational activism. Um, so a lot of this has to do with what um, has been going on in the wider um, Indian context after the rise of the Bharatiya Janata Party or BJP, um, which is seen as um, a political arm of a group of um, civil society organizations known as the Sangh Parivar, um, which ascribed to um, more of a Hindu nationalist ideology, um, focusing on Hindu majoritarianism. Um, and to be a true Indian, one uh, must um, be a Hindu, have that religious affiliation. Um, and uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who's the current Prime Minister of India, um, became the Prime Minister in May 2014. And there's been a lot of um, large scale instances of anti Christian violence, even uh, well before 2014. Um, but there's been a lot of reports of incidents, um, especially even after uh, 2014. And a lot of people have felt that, um, you know, the rise of uh, the BJP's power, both in the central government in India and in many state governments, um, has served to, in a sense, um, legitimate some of those instances of violence and uh, various intercommunal tensions. So not just between Hindus and Christians, but Hindus and Muslims, et cetera. Um, and there's also a number of organizations uh, within the North American context, both um, you know, Indian Christians of different denominational backgrounds, uh, and also um, organizations that um, you know, are very much interreligious in nature. Uh, and a lot of them have focused attention on some of these instances um, and have lobbied, um, you know, even US officials um, and have encouraged them to bring this to the attention of the Indian government. You know, they've um, uh, advocated uh, even directly um, towards the Indian government, have done work in India, et cetera. Um, they've also done a lot of uh, prayer meetings, prayer rallies um, to bring attention to these. Um, and there's not much academic research on a lot of these topics or even on Indian Christians um, as a transnational community in general. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to focus on this. And these are um, just some of the instances of violence against Christians in India that many of the participants that I had in um, my research, um, things that they've highlighted, uh, things that have been highlighted in uh, ethnic media and international media. Um, so one of those was uh, in 1999, the murder of the Australian missionary, Graham Staines and his sons in the state of um, Odisha, it was uh, called Arissa. Um, and uh, also the violence against Christians in the Kandamal district of uh, Orissa in 2008, uh, which led to the displacement of um, tens of thousands of people. Um, you know, thousands of people were injured um, and about 60 people were killed. Um, and, you know, also even more recent incidents thinking about um, sexual violence against Catholic nuns, desecration of churches, et cetera. Um, so even, you know, thinking about all these issues, um, I have, the, these are the overarching research questions that I had for the larger project. 
um, thinking about, you know, how does one's identity or, you know, intersecting aspects of their identity or translocational positionality really um, influence the way people respond to these events, how they engage with other um, Indian Christians or other people um, across um, transnational boundaries. Uh, and something else that really came out of this was looking at, um, you know, how these events play a role in people's understandings of interreligious relations. Um, so that's what I'll be focusing on for this presentation. Um, so my main argument for this presentation is that hope for solidarity across boundaries. Um, and part of my analysis really also looked at people of different denominational backgrounds, um, you know, uh, you know, say uh, Catholic, Orthodox, various Protestant denominations, different caste backgrounds. Um, but for the purposes of time, I'll really just be focusing on Hindu Christian relations for this. So, you know, um, what brings about this hope for that interreligious solidarity, despite all the things that have been going on in the current um, political and social climate? And um, my argument is that memories of communal harmony in the homeland brings about that hope. Uh, uh, Indian Christians experiences in the host country, so uh, particularly US and Canada, uh, mutual respect for religious salience, so the importance of religion in everyday life. Um, and to a lesser degree, thinking about um, identification with the minority status of Christians in India, even though um, a lot of Christians in um, North America would technically be considered part of the majority religion. But once again, we have to think about the complexity of intersecting aspects of their identity, um, which really gets at the importance of looking at uh, translocational positionality as a concept. But I'm not gonna be really focusing on that last point here. That was something that was very significant looking at um, interdenominational relationships and also thinking about the identity of caste. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, these are some of the main components of my theoretical framework um, and how I see my research situated in the literature partially. So the concept of translocational positionality, again, noting that, you know, people can occupy um, different social locations and have different levels of power and privilege um, across time and space. So, you know, even thinking about experiences that people might have had in India um, and then, you know, comparing and contrasting that with what they've experienced, um, you know, in uh, the host country. Uh, so once again, a US and Canada. Um, and I seeing that religious salience or the importance of religion in everyday life uh, is really a key aspect of uh, people's identity that plays into this. Um, also focusing on memory, particularly how collective memories are produced um, and how, and that ties right into how people think about these instances of violence that have happened in recent decades um, the current political climate, uh, when we focus on Hindu nationalists or also known as Hindutva ideology. Um, and also, you know, once again, that can be mixed uh, in thinking about um, memories of communal harmony, as I, as I mentioned before. Um, I also bring in the concept of transnational social fields. So once again, thinking about kind of that web of power relations and um, the different actors that people engage with across transnational spaces, um, and also that's what influences their ideas about interreligious relations. So when we think about actors across the transnational social fields that Indian Christians occupy, um, we have to also include, once again, the Indian state, um, transnational organizations. So these might be uh, human rights organizations, they can be Hindu organizations, um, and also uh, their relationships with people that they have had across time and space. And I also argue 
that we need to consider the spiritual realm as well, not just looking at social, political, economic, um, but the fact that there are spiritual actors um, that need to be considered here and people place a lot of value on that. And that's something that hasn't been focused on a lot in the literature. Um, so my methodology quickly um, was qualitative. Uh, I did 47 semi-structured interviews with Indian Christians um, across uh, the US and Canada. Um, and a lot of this was purpose of sampling and snowball sampling. Uh, I had a participants from diverse ethno-linguistic and denominational backgrounds from a lot of different Indian states, mostly from South India, which also um, is parallel to some of the higher populations of Christians within India. Uh, four of my participants had actually converted from Hinduism, which offered a really interesting and nuanced perspective. Uh, I did participation at six, uh, observation at six events. Um, a lot of these were meetings of Indian Christian organizations. I also went to a church service and I reviewed uh, various um, ethnic media articles, international media, et cetera. Um, so this is really just representing um, where uh, a lot of my participants came from. A lot of them were first-generation immigrants. Um, so that was also something that was very interesting. A lot of them have been in um, the US or Canada for an extended period of time. So in summary, my findings, um, I found that in focusing on the role of memory, translocational positionality, um, and how that influenced people's ideas about Hindu-Christian relations and do we have a hope <laughs> uh, for solidarity. Um, was that perceptions of boundaries between Hindus and Christians is mediated by memories of the homeland and their host country experiences. Um, so once again, you know, there were some people who grew up in very more cosmopolitan cities in India, such as Bombay or now called Mumbai. Um, and they interacted with people of various backgrounds or you know, they might have even grown up in more rural areas where they had a lot of contact with um, people of Hindu backgrounds. Um, uh, so I had a mix uh, of participants. So that was very interesting. Um, but once again, this also played into uh, mixed views that people had about division and hope for communal harmony. Um, and you know, I, this point and my next point that religious salience can be connected to conflicts and a crossing across those boundaries was that, you know, the transnational reach of Hindutva ideology has really complicated <laughs> uh, Hindu Christian relations and how people perceive that um, within the diaspora. Uh, so this is just a quote um, from one of my participants. There is hope for positive intercommunal relations, but it all depends on if individuals choose to think for themselves, not their opinions based on someone else's ideology. Um, so this participant had grown up in Mumbai and you know, noted that he had a lot of uh, Hindu neighbors who he actually said, you know, acted more Christ-like than a lot of his Christian <laughs> friends and neighbors. Um, but, you know, he, along with many of my other participants, noted, you know, how this is, uh, you know, been complicated by a lot of intercommunal conflicts, not just looking at Hindu Christian conflicts across India, but even Hindu Muslim conflicts. Um, and, you know, some of my participants also talked about Christian Muslim relations in India, but for the sake of time, I won't be focusing on that. So I have a couple of quotes that highlight some of these key uh, findings. Um, and, and this is a very interesting quote. So this is um, by a Protestant minister um, who has been very politically engaged in transnational activism, focused on um, you know, a lot of these instances of violence, uh, very anti-Hindutva. Um, and he's really talking about a dialogue that he and other Indian Christians had with um, members of the RSS, which is one of the uh, Hindu nationalist organizations. 
Um, so this conversation actually happened in the US and he was basically saying that, you know, um, there's a lot in here that I, I unfortunately don't have the time to get into, um, but he felt that, you know, the person was very staunch in their views um, and they also really uh, were, were focusing a lot on the caste system. Um, but then he contrasts that with another friend he had who is a Hindu Brahmin um, and they found commonality in, um, you know, how they focused a lot on uh, Gandhian philosophy and they were very much against um, things like apartheid in South Africa. Um, you know, which really went against uh, human rights ideals. So that was something else that uh, was very interesting, but exhibit some of those points. Um, this is actually a quote which I think highlights the finding of the importance of mutual respect for religious salience and catalyzing hope uh, for intergroup solidarity. Um, and this came up um, really kind of illustrates the importance of respect for religious ritual and the, how that can be a bridge um, across communal um, boundaries. So uh, this was from a, a Goan Catholic couple who were talking about in the Indian state of Goa where they came from, um, there's a Catholic feast called the Feast of Our Lady of Miracles. Um, and a lot of Hindus would come uh, to the statue of the Blessed Mother Mary um, and were very respectful um, and would participate in this, um, this feast day and this worship. Um, despite, you know, once again, all of these tensions that um, have been happening between the two communities. Um, I just wanted to kind of, um, since I'm running out of time, but um, Something else when we think about the importance of religious salience or the importance of religion in everyday life um, was this notion of not just religious rituals, but prayer um, as a way to kind of um, bridge those uh, tensions. So um, there was a story uh, one of my participants related and um, this person was a convert from Hinduism and their family was actually involved in Hindutva organizations. And he told the story of how, you know, his mother had cancer and he said, I'm gonna pray for you. I'm gonna bring my pastor to pray for you. And, you know, she was healed. And that was really the mechanism that, you know, his family was, he said, actively persecuting him for um, converting to Christianity. And it, it stopped after that. Um, and a lot of people mentioned, you know, um, uh, Hindu friends, uh, neighbors, family members saying, will you pray for me? I'll, you know, so sharing that notion of prayer. So this once again gets at the importance of not just looking at the transnational social field, but the spiritual elements as well. Um, so just to wrap up, I think uh, there can be a lot more research on this topic and that can be directed at the nuanced connections between religious beliefs, values, and the mechanisms um, for mobilizing into religious coalitions uh, to really think about, you know, the role of global human rights ideals in this. You know, a lot of my participants also talked about, once again, that shared notion of the importance of religious freedom um, and how that was shared with people of other faiths and that helped to kind of coalesce <laughs> relationships around the importance of, um, you know, uh, you know, anti, you know, opposing violence. Um, and also we can think about various other communities that could serve as uh, comparative cases. Um, so that's something else I think we can definitely focus on. Um, when we think about inter-religious -relig relations in particular. Um, and I just wanted to share this quote in closing from one of my participants, that India's strength is unity and diversity. Uh, and I think, you know, also employing that strengths-based perspective on a macro level and looking at these issues is really important. You know, we can all, always point out um, the problems and the negatives. Um, but this is another way to look at it.
Uh, so I thank you very much for your time and I look forward to the discussion.